Well, the idea of carbon taxes has been around for a long time and what I'm going to do first is just go over a few basic concepts about them and spell out a few cautions that add to all the, the conditions that I have in mind today and then go on to explain the idea of a temperature index tax. So a carbon tax builds a tax per tonne of CO2 emissions into the price of all forms of fossil energy, oil, coal and natural gas. Since fuel buyers want to save money, any emission reduction option that costs less than the tax would otherwise be less than the tax that would otherwise be paid will be adopted. And the result is that the market will go out and discover all the abatement options that cost less than the tax. And so the abatement that gets done is that which minimizes the cost of reducing emissions. So as a result, the carbon tax is theoretically the most efficient tool for reducing CO2 emissions. And in an economic analysis of climate policy, economists always think in terms of an emissions tax precisely because it's a, a simple instrument that minimizes the cost of whatever emission reductions you use or you achieve. But there are three cautions that uh, I would say are always taken for granted by economists but need to be spelled out in actual practice. The first is that carbon taxes are efficient if they're used instead of, not on top of, other regulatory mechanisms. Anyone arguing for a carbon tax without simultaneously arguing for the removal of all the other carbon regulations doesn't really understand the concept. Layering a carbon tax on top of a mishmash of other carbon and green regulation just exacerbates the inefficiency of the existing regulations. It doesn't introduce any new cost savings. Now the problem is that by now, pretty much every country has introduced some forms of ad hoc CO2 regulations, if not via direct emissions controls, then via indirect measures like energy efficiency standards and renewable energy programs. So no country is actually in a position to benefit from introducing carbon taxes until they first dismantle this uh, previously existing structure of inefficient regulatory policies. And in the absence of some kind of a, an interest in doing so, uh, carbon taxes would likely do more harm than good as I say, by exacerbating the inefficiencies of the system that's already in place. So that's always on the table uh, in terms of the underlying concept. A second point is that the tax in economic terms is conceived of as revenue neutral. And that means we imagine using the tax revenue not to support new spending, but to uh, reduce uh, the rates of other taxes that already exist in the system. Uh, carbon taxes are revenue instruments for the government and can be analyzed as such. Any new tax diminishes the welfare of consumers and producers and the reduction in welfare always exceeds the value of the money that the tax raises. And that difference is called the excess burden of the tax. And it arises because of the way people respond to price changes. Now some taxes have fairly small excess burdens attached to them and some have very large excess burdens. The ones that have relatively small excess burdens arise in markets that are called inelastic, which means they're not so responsive to price changes. Energy markets tend to be inelastic. So just as a tax measure, a CO2 tax would be relatively less burdensome than some taxes like payroll taxes where the elasticities are larger. So, there have been lots of studies, including ones that I did many years ago for Canada, showing that if you introduce a small carbon tax and use the money to reduce payroll taxes, you would actually come out roughly even or even slightly ahead in terms of the macro economy. However, that only works for low carbon tax rates. The excess burden of any one tax goes up with the square of the tax rate. So eventually a rise in carbon tax would cause deadweight losses larger than the benefits that you get from reducing the other tax rates. And this effect likely kicks in before the tax has gotten high enough to generate much in the way of real emission reductions. So there is no avoiding the fact that emission reductions, even using revenue neutral carbon taxes, are likely to be costly. Now, some carbon tax proposals have the idea attached to them that you use the revenue to subsidize other emission abatement options. And I want to emphasize that that is the worst possible use of carbon tax revenue. So think about the efficiency gain from carbon taxes. It induces the market to find all the least cost abatement options. The options that the market rejects are the expensive and ineffective ones. If you then use the revenue to subsidize all the strategies that the market didn't adopt, you're using the tax revenue to destroy the efficiency of the tax instrument. So again, 
it's taken for granted in the economic literature. The carbon tax revenue is used in a revenue neutral way to, uh, uh, to reduce other taxes. It's not used to fund new emission reduction options that the market didn't choose to do on its own. The third point with carbon taxes is that price is the target, not quantity. Again, this is, it, it's kind of obvious what, to be stated as such, but it's easily lost sight of. So let me explain uh, the point here. You can think of there being a demand curve for emission reductions, or demand curve for CO2 emissions. Uh, on the horizontal axis, picture that being a measure of the total emissions, and we'll say 500 megatons, just for example. And then on the vertical axis, the amount of the carbon tax. Now, the tax is zero, so right now emissions are down at the bottom at 500. Somewhere on the vertical axis, there's an idea of what the marginal social cost is associated with those emissions, and so the economic theory would say that that should be roughly where you set your tax rate. So suppose that was 35 pounds per ton. I'm just making up that number. I don't think that's necessarily the number, the right number, but we'll say that was the number we pick. So you put that tax in place. The policy is to make emitters pay the marginal social cost of their emissions. As a result of that, in this case, emissions hardly budge. They only go down by 4%. What people would do in, the, in, in observing that would be, they would look at it and say, well, the policy is a failure because it didn't reduce emissions very much. But that's wrong. The policy is a success. The point of the policy was to make the emitters pay 35 pounds per ton for emissions, and that's what they're doing. The fact that they choose to pay the fee and continue emitting isn't a flaw in the policy. It's just the, the result of the shape of the demand curve, in this case it being fairly steep. As I mentioned before, it's an inelastic market. So the goal of an emissions tax is to have emitters pay a price. If somebody came along and said, well, we were really intending for emissions to fall down to 250 units, we wanted emissions to drop in half, the problem is that's an infeasible combination. You can't get there at 35 pounds per ton. You'd have to charge much higher than that, but then you're not charging the marginal social damages. So uh, this kind of a policy forces you to pick the price that you think emitters should pay, and then it's up to the market to choose the quantity of emissions. The alternative as in the case of an emissions trading system, is to pick the quantity and then the market tells you how much it's going to cost to get there and then people complain about the price volatility and price swings. But that's, again, not a failure of the policy. That's just the reality of pricing in an inelastic market. So those are the three points that I won't revisit them uh, all that much, but they are taken for granted in the economics literature, namely uh, carbon tax is a replacement for the existing mix of policies, not a, something to put on top of them. Revenues should reduce other taxes, not pay for abatement options that the market rejected. And the success of the policy should be based on whether it enacts the price for emissions, not whether it yields some arbitrary change in the quantity. Okay, now we move to the dynamic problem. You have two basic questions to answer with a carbon tax. First of all, how do, where do you start it? And secondly, how do you adjust the path, the tax path over time? So I've said that you could start a low carbon tax, recycle the revenue into the tax system, and you wouldn't really cause any macroeconomic problems. So let's suppose that people could agree on that and you have a low tax rate to start with. But then the much bigger question is, should that tax go up quickly over time or should it stay low? Now in the graph here, uh, the data points up to the vertical line are actual observations of atmospheric temperatures as measured by satellites. And then the lines going ahead of that represent two possible paths of the future. The gray dots going forward, path two, indicates that there's no upward trend. The black dots, path one, indicates a sharp upward trend. Which one actually is going to be observed would tell you what kind of policy path you need. The problem, of course, is we don't have a time machine, so we can't go to 2040 and collect the data. So um, this is where we're stuck. Basically, uh, even if people could agree on a starting value for a carbon tax, they can't agree on the adjustment rule. And um, there have been lots of elaborate means of trying to figure out what those paths are going to look like. So there are integrated assessment models, which are formed by assuming that we know all the parameters of the climate system and the parameters of the economic system and putting them all together in a computer and cranking out uh, 
uh, a tax path. But then, of course, that's just assuming away all the uncertainties. So it's not really an optimal solution. It's, it's an optimal solution if you believe the model, which um, people on, on all sides of the issue always find a reason to dispute the results. Another option is, is a Bayesian learning by doing. I don't really discuss it. It's been done in the economics literature. But uh, the outcome of that is it's just too slow. We don't ever learn whether we're on the right path in time to make a good decision. What I'm proposing here is something called a state contingent rule. Now, this is the only math you'll see, and I won't even explain what it means, so uh, don't worry too much about it. The point here is it's possible using a bit of mathematics to write down <coughs> what would be the, the formula that gives us the optimal tax path over time if we had all the information in the world about the actual climate system. And then can we come up with another rule that uses data that we actually have and that we can observe, and that gives us a good approximation to that tax path over time? And the answer is yes. It's a state contingent rule, and it really comes down to that expression there where we make the tax rate a function of some temperature measure that is recording how CO2 affects the climate. So I'll explain in more detail which particular temperature measure I have in mind and why. But let's just imagine that that's now in place. So imagine there is now a tax in place, and you don't know what the rate's going to be next year. You know what it is now, and you know what the rule is that's going to be used to adjust that tax over time. And that rule is going to raise the tax if the temperature is going up. So first of all, if you are in a position, say, of, of building a pulp and paper mill, and you've got several billion dollars worth of investments at stake, uh, you need to start to form expectations of what that tax is going to do. So you have incentives to get the most accurate possible information about the future path of climate. No one has an incentive in that situation to ignore valid information. And alternatively, people don't have an incentive to promote information that's obviously dubious. Or well, they can try. It's just, it's like trying to sell bad economic forecasts. Eventually, forecasters get weeded out if they're always wrong. Uh, maybe that doesn't happen, so yeah. forget, ignore that example. I <laughs> wish. Um, however, the, under this system, the bottom line is if the atmosphere warms up, the tax is going to go up, period, and vice versa. If it doesn't warm up, tax is not going to go up, period. So now we have a very different set of incentives confronting the market, namely get the most accurate and objective information that we can and start making plans consistent with objective expectations about the climate. So which particular thermometer? Uh, in the paper, I propose uh, a particular region of the atmosphere called the tropical troposphere. Now this very attractive bit of, of uh, colored wallpaper is from the IPCC report, the uh, fourth <coughs> assessment report. Um, there are six panels. Look at the top left panel, the one labeled sun. On the horizontal axis is latitude, and on the vertical axis is altitude. And the color represents the amount of temperature change. And what this is doing is it's simulating the 20th century atmosphere if the only thing that changed over the 20th century was the observed brightening of the sun. So you can see the yellow represents a bit of warming, the blue represents a bit of cooling. Mainly what you get as a result of the solar change is just a kind of a general diffuse warming through the layers of the atmosphere from the surface right up to the top of the stratosphere, which is at the top of the diagram. If you go to the next panel to the right, the volcanoes panel, you have cooling down below, warming up above, but not very intense either way. And that's if the only thing that happened over the 20th century was the volcanic activity that was observed. Now if you look at the uh, middle panel in the first column, that's the greenhouse gases panel. So that's the model run where the only thing that changes is the observed increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So notice, first of all, that it's not even warming all throughout the atmosphere. It's not even even at the surface. What you see is that big red dot there, and that's in the tropics. So it's uh, 30 degrees north and south of the equator. And it's in the troposphere, meaning the lower half of the atmosphere. It's, it's a little less than the lower half of the atmosphere. And the models all say, as a result of the extra CO2 that goes into the atmosphere, there should be a very rapid warming trend in the tropical troposphere. And that's 
what the model is generating as, in a sense, the fingerprint of global warming due to greenhouse gases. There's cooling up above in the stratosphere and intense warming in the, in the troposphere in the tropics. And the scale of that warming is large enough that if you look at the bottom right panel, which is the total of all the changes, that looks more or less like the greenhouse gas panel because it's such a large change in comparison to all the others that it dominates the whole picture. So this is uh, a climate model reproduction of what the 20th century should have looked like given the observed changes in sun, volcanoes, ozone, greenhouse gases, sulfate aerosols. Now, all the models say the same thing. This is not just one particular model. As the report itself says, upper tropospheric warming reaches a maximum in the tropics and is seen even in the early century time period. They're referring there to a run into the future where you start adding CO2 to the atmosphere and right away you see the change in the tropical troposphere. The pattern is very similar over the three periods, namely early, middle, and late century, consistent with the rapid adjustment of the atmosphere to the forcing, and this part's key. This is a region of the climate system where you don't have long legs. There's a rapid adjustment. There's no point looking at the deep oceans to see what the CO2 does to the climate because it's such a slow system down there to respond. Tropical troposphere, though, rapidly adjusts to the forcing. And the changes are simulated with good consistency among the models. So, the tropical mid-troposphere is the atmosphere's own leading indicator. It's highly sensitive to changes in greenhouse gases. It doesn't have much change in response to the typical variations in other forcings. And large changes due to greenhouse gases should already be underway, should already be observable. Another nice thing is that it's monitored by two independent systems, satellites and weather balloons, and there are at least five different labs processing the data. And so there are multiple sources of information on the tropical troposphere. It's easy to get the data online too, by the way. This, this is uh, routinely available and, and widely uh, monitored by uh, scientists and experts. Okay, so getting to an implementation. Again, we start at low, say it's something like $10 a ton. Nobody would really notice that it's there. The IPCC predictions for the tropical troposphere using central emission scenarios imply that that tax would start ticking up pretty quickly. It would, could rise to between $40 and $200 per ton by the year 2100. Okay, but what if nobody believes the forecasts? Well, here's where it's interesting. You see, nobody has an incentive to ignore the forecasts if they're valid. But what everybody has an incentive to check them for accuracy. People would have an incentive to go back and ask, well, how well did those models do in the past? What do we know about the models? And if we don't use the models, what else would we use for forecasting? But all those are the kinds of questions that would draw out accurate, objective information. Now, one of the objections that I usually get at this point is someone will say, yeah, but this is a backward-looking policy. What we're doing is we're waiting to see the change in the atmosphere, then we adjust the policy, and by then it's too late. Uh, but that ignores the fact that First of all, the tropical troposphere responds rapidly to changing CO2 levels, but more importantly, it's not that the atmosphere is forward-looking, it's investors are forward-looking. So investors don't care what yesterday's tax rate was. They're making plans based on the expected future tax rates, and that's where the forward-looking behavior comes in. So it's a forward-looking policy that marshals all the available information to um, uh, to affect today's decision making with the best information we can get about what the future climate's going to look like in response to the emissions that have taken place already and are likely going to take place. Now, we can add to this another concept, which is a futures market. Uh, and I'll explain the futures market, but what this is going to do is if there were lags in the effect of the emissions on the climate, all that would do is create an arbitrage opportunity for traders. So the futures market will also eliminate any of this backward-looking aspect to the policy. Now, the futures market was not my idea. It was proposed by a law professor at UBC, he's now at Florida State, Xiling Su, who uh, had looked at this, liked the idea, thought this is really neat, we could generate a prediction market. If you create, or if the government creates, a set of tradable emission exemption certificates. So each certificate, they're dated up to 30 years in advance, each one exempts you from paying the tax on one ton of emissions for that year. 
And now there's a market <coughs> for these exemption certificates running out 30 years in advance. As a result of the trading that would take place and the amount of money that's at stake as a result of a, a tax system like this, uh, a huge amount of effort would be put into price discovery for these tradable emission certificates. That would create the world's best climate model. So if you think about what that path would look like, there's a path of, of futures prices now for uh, these exemption certificates. That reveals the market's expectation of how much warming there's going to be. Now, suppose you're a scientist, you're doing some work on climate, you, you're very worried about this, you think there's going to be a rapid warming take place. And you're frustrated because policymakers don't listen to you and you don't think there's enough of a response. In this case, the market's not going to ignore that kind of person. They will take that person seriously, they'll take their science seriously, they'll look at it, but they will judge the credibility of it. If it's credible science, that's a buying opportunity for people. They're going to start buying up the cheap permits in the expectation that actually there's going to be a lot more warming, the tax rate's going to be much higher, these exemption certificates are going to be worth much more than we paid for them. So all you have to do if you're a scientist in that situation, you're thinking there's going to be a big tipping point, say five years from now, and the price of these permits is about to spike. Well, first of all, all you have to do is convince some investors of your findings uh, in order to start inducing changes in the, the, the market price. And the investors have every incentive to listen to you. But added to that, if you really do have valid information, you can invest your pension in these future certificates. And you could potentially do very well. Instead of complaining about the fact that nobody's listening to you, you can start to think, I have an advantage here. I have some private information about what these prices are going to do a couple of years from now. And on the other hand, if such a scientist is not willing to risk his own pension on his science, then maybe he shouldn't expect everybody else to risk theirs as well. <laughs> so in practice, would such a tax go up? Well, I don't know. I do not know the answer. My opinion on this is completely worthless. I'll just show you the sort of puzzle that would confront investors. This is a graph showing the climate model outputs for the tropical mid-troposphere from all the models that are being used for the current draft of the IPCC report. Uh, the data starts in the late 1970s and runs to, in the case of models, out to 2030, and in the case of the balloon and satellite observations, out to 2012. The black line, the heavy black line, is the average of all the model runs for the observed increase in greenhouse gases up to 2007, I believe, and then the um, central emission scenario after that out to 2030. And you can see there's a spread of individual model runs there. The squares and circles are the observations from balloons and satellites for the tropical mid-troposphere starting in the late 1970s. So what are you going to base your expectations on? Um, you might decide you're still a believer in the models but you're going to have to come up with a pretty good story about why the observations are now below the low end of the modeling envelope. You might decide you're just going to extrapolate from the observations, but before you <coughs> commit to that, you better decide if there actually is something useful in the models. Again, I don't know what you would do or what an investor would do, but it would be nice to see a process like that that puts some resources into reconciling these, these disparate data sets. Right now, there actually isn't much of an incentive in the scientific community. It might surprise you to learn that although the IPCC has this information in there, they're surprisingly unconcerned about it. There's very little discussion in the, in the draft IPCC report about this, this issue. And what discussion is there is, is, uh, is fairly dismissive. It's, it's along the lines of the observations are still roughly consistent with the models. <laughs> and that seems okay with them. So I'm assuming they don't have a very strong incentive to reconcile the models and all the hypotheses that are embedded in the models with the observations. But a market confronting a tax rate like I, I, I suggest here would have a big incentive to sort this out. Now one other concern that arises is the uh, possibility of price volatility. This is easy to deal with. You, you don't have to use the annual update. You can make this a three-year moving average. That would smooth most of it out. And given the amount of volatility in the European emissions trading system, what I'm proposing here would be nothing in comparison to that. Uh, 
This is a graph showing, using the formula that I proposed, I, I published a, an academic article in an in a economics journal two years ago explaining how the formula is derived and, and um, uh, how this could be implemented. And this graph shows if the tax was started in the year 2002 at $15 per ton, what the tax rate would have been every year. You can see it actually goes negative quite a few years and, and would be negative in 2012. Um, and then if the gray line is the three-year <laughs> moving average. So there is a slight upward trend there. It's, it's not nearly what the IPCC models would predict, but um, it would suggest, based on the three-year moving average, that you could be adding a few dollars per decade to this price. Another question is, could this be implemented unilaterally? Obviously, there isn't going to be a global tax treaty or a global tax implementation, but this is a problem with any climate policy. You don't have international coordination. That's obvious at this point. What's different about this policy, though, is at a low starting level, it's actually unilaterally beneficial for a country. To, it, it's effectively a shift slightly away from income taxation, slightly towards uh, energy consumption taxation, which just on a public finance basis, a lot of economists would look at that and say, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, at worst neutral, it might even be slightly beneficial. So there's no harm unilaterally doing this, and especially if you replace all that messy hodgepodge of inefficient energy regulations with a beneficial tax reform, I'm not suggesting that Britain has a bunch of inefficient energy regulations to consider getting rid of, but if you did, uh, this would be a, a way of doing it. But the real prize here would be the global benefit of a, of a market emerging, and everybody else could look and see that futures price path. I have no idea what it would look like. I'd be dead curious to know what that price path would look like and how people would respond to it. Again, if, if, if some scientist looked at that and thought, oh, that's way too low. I mean, the price is going to be way higher than that. Then don't get upset. Just get out your checkbook and start buying up tax futures. And if on the skeptic side, if they think, hi, oh, you guys are wasting your money, uh, you could go short the futures if you wanted to get into some serious trading. Um, otherwise, all we have to do, if you see the price path, you think it's too high, then you would just say, don't buy the futures, just wait and pay the tax when the day comes. Um, also, uh, in the paper I make mention of this, uh, this report that came out from Lord Stern about the so-called carbon bubble, the idea that we are definitely in for a lot of global warming. As a result, we are definitely in for very aggressive emission control policies around the world. As a result, a lot of fossil fuel assets are worth much less than the market currently values them at, and a lot of them will never even be taken out of the ground. So then there was an article in The Guardian in which people like Jeremy Grantham were quoted saying, well, I'm divesting from all my fossil fuel holdings. Um, on the other hand, the market itself didn't really respond too much. Um, so the question then is, well, who's right? Should we all be divesting from uh, fossil fuel assets? Well, in this case, if this was the policy that's in place, that's the wrong question. The, the issue then would be, well, if you really think that that tax rate's going to go up, you can start hedging your portfolio with some of these tax futures, rather than making these drastic decisions uh, to divest a hundred billion euro portfolio of holdings in conventional fossil energy. Seems to me a kind of a, a risky strategy. Instead, you could just do some hedging in the futures market, which would be a, seems to me, a much more sensible approach. Okay, that is the report, and uh, I think there's some time for questions. So I think we would all like to thank uh, Professor McKittrick. Uh, uh, Ross, you have presented an extremely neat proposal, uh, which is, uh, has a, uh, given rise to a great deal of interest, and it also has the great virtue of clarifying a lot of the analytic issues that need to be discussed in this area. That even if nothing is done, nothing is implemented, the, 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 the sort of laser-like, search-like beam you put on the issues as a result of this proposal is extremely worthwhile. I, I, I have been thinking uh, while you were listening to the discussion, which is an excellent, we've had some very good questions, uh, 
as to uh, what are the circumstances in which a government might implement your proposal. And it seems to me that it would, there is one set of circumstances. We haven't quite got it at the moment, uh, but it could happen in one significant country at some time, maybe even in this country. If a government realizes, comes to realize that the mishmash of regulatory uh, controls and subsidies and everything else which, are, which are, it is introduced uh, in order to uh, avoid the threat of what is known as catastrophic global warming. If it, it discovers that this is really hugely inefficient, hugely damaging to the economy, and hugely and increasingly unpopular, how is it get itself, going to get itself off the hook? It's not going to be, it's been, governments are going to find it very difficult to say, oh, well, we got everything wrong, let's abandon everything. But they might say, we've got a new and better approach. <laughs> we've got the McKittrick tax, and that's what we're going to move to. And not only does it, is it a way of easing governments off the hook, which one day I think they'll be very grateful for, <laughs> uh, but also uh, it means that they will be raising taxation, and as you say, the, 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 it will be tax revenue neutral, but they'll be raising taxation in a way that will be less um, unpopular with the public. Uh, when I was Chancellor, we always used to put up cigarette tax, because it was the one tax, he says you've got to raise taxation, it was the one tax that when you raised it, you had a whole lot of people say, what a good idea. Every other tax, when you increased it, people were unhappy. Uh, so here is a tax, you, you will be able to get more revenue to finance your public expenditure and you reduce other taxes and the people think this is great, we're paying uh, a tax which we should be paying. And the government gets revenue, the people will be happy to get itself off the hook. So I think there is a place, uh, Ross, for your uh, brilliant idea. Just and promise me you won't on, call it the McKittrick tax. On behalf of <laughs> or even the McKittrick weeds. <laughs> but anyhow, on behalf of us all, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for crossing the Atlantic to give us this presentation today. Thank you.